Hi, I'm Lori Klain, English teacher, and I'm here today to talk to you about writing poetry in meter. You may think of yourself as a poet, or perhaps you are just beginning on this journey. Maybe it's free verse that has drawn you to poetry. I'm here to tell you that writing poetry in meter is a valuable exercise, that by learning how to manipulate rhythm, you will become a stronger writer. Try not to think of it as a 19th century exercise. Try to think of it as a way to learn how to use language in a more powerful way. Our goal for the day is to write a metrical poem. By the time we're done with this exercise, I'm hoping you will have the beginnings of something that you're really going to be able to use to build, to create your own original metered poem. For today's adventure, we'll start by doing a little warm-up writing because it's always good to warm up. We're going to find some inspiration in the rhythm of a fabulous poet who knew how to use meter to his advantage. We're going to brainstorm some content or maybe look at the start of a poem that you're actually currently writing. We'll examine word choice, really interrogate those words, look at what they present. Those opportunities are there and you should take advantage of them. We are going to then use those words to help you come up with a rhythm or maybe switch it up and consider the importance of line length and the way you might want to structure lines or a particular phrase that resonates with you that will help you decide how to use line length to your advantage. Line length is a powerful tool. It can make your poem move along quickly. It can stretch it out elegantly. Lastly, we're going to really dig in and write and create something beautiful. Let's warm up for five minutes. I would like you to write a brief poem. You can do this in your writer's notebook that begins with one of the following lines. The night was icy, but I didn't mind. Your fingerprints were all around the room. My father never tells me what he thinks. There's something hiding underneath my bed. You changed your name, but couldn't change your face. I couldn't think of anything to say. Turn off the video, set a timer for five minutes, and see what you come up with. Now that you've gotten a start, let's take a few minutes to talk about the importance of meter and just to understand the basic rhythmic patterns. Here are the patterns to know in English. There's an I am, da dum, a trochee, dum da, a dactyl, dum da da, an anapest, da da dum, and a spondy, dum dum. I will tell you that if you look at the words in the right hand column, it will help guide you in your understanding of these particular patterns. The important thing to know is that each of these particular patterns represents a foot. If you put five iams together, you have iambic pentameter. If you put three trochees together, you have trochaic trimeter. For today's inspiration, we are going to hear a poem by William Butler Yeats. This particular poem uh, was written in 1892, and he wrote it to Maud Gaughan, an actress and revolutionary with whom he had an obsession for many, many years. He asked her to marry him at least three times. She refused every time. Um, Yeats has this incredible voice and knows how to manipulate rhythm. He won the Nobel Prize in 1923. He is considered to be by many the greatest Irish poet to ever live and by others to be the greatest poet who ever lived. So you should be familiar with him. Let's listen to When You Are Old. When you are old and gray and full of sleep, and nodding by the fire, take down this book and slowly read and dream of the soft look your eyes had once and of their shadows deep. How many loved your moments of glad grace and loved your beauty with love false or true, but one man loved the pilgrim soul in you and loved the sorrows of your changing face. 
and bending down beside the glowing bars. Murmur, a little sadly, how love fled, and paced upon the mountains overhead, and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. Let's take a minute to look at what Yeats is doing here in this beautiful poem. So if we try to figure out what the meter is, you can listen to the first line. When you are old and gray and full of sleep. He begins with an unstressed syllable and then stresses one. When you are old and gray and full of sleep. This pattern, unstressed, stressed, is an I am. How many I am's are there in the line? One, two, three, four, five. That makes this line iambic pentameter. Let's see if he does the rest of the poem that way. Okay, so look at the whole poem as it is scanned right now. Looking at it, you can notice that the iambic pentameter is fairly consistent, except for some interesting moments. Here, Yeats does this interesting little pattern and slowly read and dream of the soft look. Soft look has a bit more emphasis, interestingly, because soft look has about it a very soft sound. Then we have consistent iambic pentameter throughout the poem until we get to another one of these interesting moments. Glad grace. How many loved your moments of glad grace. Right there, the moment of glad grace has a beautiful bit of alliteration. And again, we are pointing toward the object of the speaker's desires. Soft look glad grace. These two moments when he is praising her and thinking of her and imagining her. But then he does something very interesting here in this line. And loved your beauty with love false or true. This is where suddenly it's like, whoa, wait a minute. There are others who may have loved you, but their love may have been false or true. And there's only one man, one man, who loved the pilgrim soul in you. So this moment right here, he's saying, hold on, there are those who don't love you the way that I do. Now, if we go through the rest of the poem, you'll see that there's another critical moment where he steps out of iambic pentameter, and that is right here. And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled. Right here, he is giving her a command. He is saying, this is the thing that you're going to do. You're going to murmur a little sadly about the fact that I am now gone. And the end of the poem is very consistently in iambic pentameter because he wants to take us home and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. I can't, of course, read it as beautifully as Colin Farrell, but that's a gorgeous ending of a poem. Okay, so now that we've looked at one of the greatest poems ever written, we're going to pretend we're Yeats. <laughs> hmm. Maybe not, but let's look at his words, okay? So these are, are some of the words within the poem that have lexical density. They are the words on which the meaning hangs. And so if we examine them closely, you can see, interestingly enough, there are a lot of single syllables, not complicated words. Almost all of them are trochees if they are two syllables. For instance, nodding is a trochee. Slowly, shadows, moments, beauty, pilgrim, sorrows, changing, bending, beside. Hmm, beside is not a trochee. Beside is one of the few I am's in the poem. Glowing, 
glowing is a trochee, murmur is a trochee, little, sadly, mountains. And then we have the interesting overhead, which is begins with a trochee and then has another strong syllable at the end that is emphasized, and amid. Amid is also an I am. Maybe Yeats saw all of these trochees and single syllable words and thought, aha, I can put them together to make some beautiful I am's that will echo the beating of the speaker's heart and nodding and slowly, how many and bending. All of those I am's have the musical heartbeat that forms the meter of the poem. We don't know how Yeats did this, but maybe he started with the words. So where do you start? Do you begin with content or meter? It's very difficult to say. Do you have something in the corner of your mind or at the heart of your thoughts? Once you're there, I want you to actually get your thoughts down on paper and don't fret about meter. I just want you to stop and write for five minutes. You'll be writing in phrases, you might make lists. I just want you to see if you're finding that certain words keep coming up over and over. And then look at the meter of those words. Take five minutes to do that right now. So here's another way to think about poetry. You can begin with a line. You might have a phrase that is lingering. You might have looked back on your free write and say, wait, it's not so much the words that are dictating rhythm as this one line that I love. Look at this first line. Your fingerprints were all around the room. You might have chosen that one to do your free write at the beginning of this exercise. If you did, you may have also noticed that that line is in iambic pentameter. It is full, but it's not overly full. Look at the next line. Underneath the old tree, memorizing the truth, we reclined. That line is actually in anapestic pentameter. An anapest has the emphasis at the end, two unstressed syllables followed by a stressed syllable. Underneath the old tree, memorizing the truth, we reclined. Look at the next line. Show me not tomorrow. It has a quickness to it, right? This is trochaic trimeter. Show me not tomorrow. The last line, disaster loomed, is interestingly in dimeter, a form you don't see very often. There are only two feet in that line. Iambic dimeter, disaster loomed. So I want you to do this again. Stop and write for five more minutes. Are you coming up with lines that might resonate with you and help you decide where you want to land as far as your meter is concerned. Line length is super important. And here I'm going to spend some time talking about what you might do with this line length that you've come up with. So Mary Oliver in this brilliant poetry handbook has an entire section on line length its importance, and how you can use it to manipulate your meaning. Let's go over that a bit before you move forward. Pentameter is the most common line length in English. It's interesting because there's some argument that it is our breath capacity. We fall into iambic pentameter very naturally, as did Yeats. Iambic is the most common, and many people say it's because it's the standard beat of a heart. Da da, da da. Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? William Shakespeare. We shall not always plant while others reap. County Cullen. Now, everyone's not going to read every single line of poetry the exact same way, but you can hear underneath those lines that particular rhythm. Tetrameter is the next most common line, four feet per line. It speeds things up. All I could see from where I stood was three long mountains and a wood. There's a quickness to this. We step back a little bit from that breath capacity. It moves us into the next line. Trimeter is only three feet per line. And interestingly, Mary Oliver says, it speeds us up. It gives us this intense sense of agitation. When I was one and 20, I heard a wise man say, give crowns and pounds and guineas, but not your heart away. 
One of the things you're going to hear in trimeter is it can sometimes sound like a nursery rhyme. That might be very well the effect you're going for, as was Hausman in When I Was One and Twenty. Hexometer takes your poetry the other direction, five feet per line, five actual strong accented beats per line. Mary Oliver says it's luxurious and implies richness and a sense of joy. Here is Keats. For o'er the southern moors, I have a home for thee. There's something quite lyrical, beautiful, elegant about hexometer. Okay, so now I want you to stop and take your lines and your words and play. Do you want the quick speed of trimeter? Do you want to stretch out and play with some hexometer? How do your words fit together? See if you're finding kind of a natural pattern in flow. Please don't worry about rhyme right now. Um, you can rhyme, and if it starts to happen, that's fantastic, but don't worry about rhyme. Worry about meter. You might kind of have a rough draft and you might be dangerously close. You might also be kind of fed up, right? Does your meaning fit your pattern should be the question you ask yourself over and over again. If you want it to sound like a heartbeat, go with pentameter, go with iambic pentameter. See if you can use that ancient form and really embrace it. Or you know, play around with the sing-songiness that sometimes happens with, with Dimeter and Trimeter. That's perfectly up to you. Does your meaning match your actual form? That's the question you need to be asking yourself. If I want elegance, I need a longer line length. If I want to be quick, I should go with a shorter length. <laughs> Lastly, I want you actually to try to sing your poem. You might not want to do this with other people around. Here's the really fun part. Look back at what you've written. Where does your poem have a significant moment? Do you shift focus? Do you have a turn within your poem? Highlight any opportunities you might see. Oliver says variation wakes us up. I want you to find a moment where you can fall out of meter. I want you to find that magical murmur a little sadly how love fled the way that Yeats did. I want you to find that, that key moment and then mix it up a bit. It's great to do this at the beginning of a line. It's also super effective at the end of a line. You can change the meter. Remember Yeats? And bending down beside the glowing bars, murmur a little sadly how love fled and paced upon the mountains overhead and hid his face amid a crowd of stars. Now is your chance to write and rewrite, but don't forget to play. I know that music has become the poetry of the 21st century and that we don't always embrace the musicality that can be within the words we use. This is your chance to do that. Write and rewrite. See if you can embrace meter once you learn how to use it, you'll find that all of your writing has a great deal more power. Have some fun.